Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, nice conference. So today we'll talk about uh, two sample contamination uh, model testing. Um, it's a joint work with uh, Xavier Millot, Denis Pomeray, and uh, Yaya Sali. Okay, so the, the organization of my talk uh, will go this way. Uh, I will talk about uh, mixture models in general. I will explain what is the difference between parametric and uh, semi-parametric approaches. Uh, in the second part, I will uh, talk more in detail about contamination model, estimation and testing. So I will do a, a survey about the existing results, the assumptions we do on this kind of uh, models. Uh, then I will go uh, into the, the art of uh, my presentation, which is a two sample testing problem. And I will show the so-called IBM approach, which stands for inversion best matching approach. Um, in the fourth part, I will present some simulations and a nice application to, to the COVID-19 excess of mortality um, across a panel of European countries. And in, uh, in the conclusion, uh, I will uh, point the, the strengths of our approach and I will explain how we can apply this IBM approach to further models, uh, more general models, right? Okay, so first of all, let's let introduce uh, mixture models. Mixture models are basically introduced to, uh, to model um, heterogeneous um, sources of randomness. So uh, if you want to go uh, in a general framework, we can consider uh, densities like uh, G of X, which are a, a linear combination, a convex combination of densities in red, FJ, okay? And the weights of the, so the weights, here are the weights of the combination um, are in zero one and uh, their sum is equal to one. So if you want to, to sample uh, from this distribution, what do you do exactly? So you sample first um, a multinomial distribution with these weights, okay? If the result is equal to L, then you decide to sample according to F index L in your, in your sum here, okay? And so this way you have, um, okay, basket K sources of randomness all together in a sample. And the goal is to uh, estimate an hybrid parameter, which is the, the weights associated to the J components and the distribution um, given that, that state, state number J in the sum, okay? Okay, so this, this problem is, is not that simple. So to make uh, things tractable, uh, Thatcher in 61 and 63 uh, considered that the FJ could belong to a parametric family um, identifiable, um, which has been studied in these papers for Gaussian distribution and so on. And um, of course, you have a, a big concern here because if you put um, a permutation on the indexes in this sum, you don't change overall the, the distribution, okay? So you have to put a, a lexicographical ordering on the parameters, which means for the Gaussian case, for example, you have to say, okay, the first component has a lowest mean, the second component has the second lowest mean, and in case the means are equal, you have to uh, order by comparing the variances. Okay, so you have to structure the parametric space to make things identifiable, okay? And this model is now well known for years, for years, okay? And uh, the very efficient way to estimate this, these models are to, are to, to use the maximum likelihood approach and uh, of course, the very well known now EM algorithm. So, this is in one slide um, how the mixture model existed in the literature for years and years. And, uh, okay, I'll move. Since, uh, since the 60s, and then in 2003, uh, Peter Hall and, and Zhu um, changed this paradigm and say, okay, we don't need to, to put some uh, parametric structure on the mixed densities, you can consider very non-parametric approach models just by, let's consider this model. It's a, it's a simple mixture of two components in a RD 
d is supposed to be here greater than 3. And uh, if you mix this, uh, this, this distribution with independent components, clearly you have a product of densities here, marginal densities, uh, you, can, uh, you can identify this model uh, given that you have to make sure that uh, bivariate uh, densi marginal densities cannot be decomposed as a, a product of single uh, densities. If you, if you have this condition, you can retrieve the unknown P and along with the unknown um, components uh, involved in these distributions. And the open question uh, was what happens uh, in dimension one and two, okay, because you can, cannot play with the, this kind of uh, conditions anymore. And uh, this is what we did with uh, some uh, colleagues, Laurent Borde, uh, Stéphane Motley in 2006, uh, Christina Mutuccia and so on. We, we consider in dimension one uh, this very simple model uh, in which uh, we mix one given density f, which is the same here and here, just located at different places, so alpha and beta. And if you suppose that f is a zero symmetric, so it belongs to this class of uh, distributions, so the zero symmetric distribution, then you can identify p and f. Okay? That was a paper in the Journal of Statistics in 2006. And you can also consider the model of today, which is a mixture of one known component F0. You mix with another component F, unknown, located zero symmetric and located at mu. Okay? Again, with this kind of condition, plus extra things, you can estimate the known proportion and the density F without assuming anything more than it is symmetric, not uh, like Gaussian or, or and so on, okay? So this is a, a progress in the literature of uh, mixture models. Even if the models are very simple, you can do things much more than, that than the parametric case. We also extended in dimension two um, our models to uh, like uh, nonlinear uh, um, mixture of regression models. You can consider covariates here and say, okay, oh, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. I did, I mean, okay. So you can do uh, similar things and say, okay, I mix very similarly to the first model, uh, a density indexed by X also, you can index by X, given F on Fx is zero symmetric along the, the covariates, okay, and uh, your location can depend also on x, beta of x. So all these quantities are non-parametric, and the f of x is, uh, can depend also on x. And you can estimate everything in this model given just f of x is symmetric along the axes, okay? And uh, you can extend, of course, this approach again with a contamination model. So one given f, zero known, and you, you mix it with an unknown distribution f, uh, with an uh, unknown uh, location function mu of x, okay? And again, you can estimate everything in this kind of model with an uh, interesting rate of convergence. Okay. So if you're interested in this kind of literature, I, I provide you some, uh, some nice surveys. So one by Xiang Yao and Yang in uh, 2018 and by Garcia in 2019. And if we want some papers I wrote with my colleagues. You can go to my webpage as well. Everything is in there, so do not hesitate. Okay, so I would like to, to talk today more deeply about contamination models. So I will turn now into the uh, cumulative distribution function notations. I will consider uh, from now a sample x1 to xn, uh, sample from this distribution in, in which J again is, is, is known, G is known, sorry, and the F here is unknown. So you mixed uh, basically one known phenomenon with another one which is completely unknown, okay? And this model uh, has a lot of applications. Uh, for example, in, uh, in genetics, in which you, you analyze some uh, genes of a cell and the genes uh, are expressed differently, um, is are like considered like healthy or not. And if they are healthy, uh, they behave like a, 
a standard distribution, a well-known distribution, and when they behave like weirdly, they go into a trash distribution, and uh, the trash distribution is uh, the one in red, which is hard to figure out. You don't know what it is, and uh, you, don't, you just know that it's, it's there, but uh, you, you have no idea about the structure you have in F. Okay? Uh, so this is the first application. You can also use these models to model crisis, Crisis, I would say that, um, okay, if everything goes well, people have a standard behavior, and when the crisis happens, some people will keep their habits, and some of them will try to adapt, and you will get something very well known, because people didn't get time to, to change their habits, plus people uh, changing their, their mind, their <coughs> mindset, and so on. So you have a new uh, population um, adapt, which are adapting uh, to the crisis, okay? We, so I mean change of behavior here. And, uh, you can also have an uh, interesting application in actuarial science. If you open your portfolio to new customers, uh, which uh, behavior you don't know yet, so you can integrate them in this kind of mixture model. Some of them will perfectly match your previous portfolio, and some of them will uh, depart from uh, the population you know. Okay? So and the goal in this kind of model is to estimate P and F. Okay? And the, of course, minimal assumption about F. So uh, I will go a little bit into technique now, but it's very simple. Uh, so to just to explain the intuition. Uh, if you want to estimate, imagine you, you know P, you know the proportion. To estimate F, what you do? You take this term, you put it in the other side, okay, and uh, you normalize by P. That is what I'm exactly doing here. So I can create a candidate for my unknown uh, distribution F on the P, right? Since L is the distribution of the observations, I can estimate this part by uh, an empirical CDF, right? So I will call this, this estimation of F on the P the inverse uh, empirical uh, CDF on the P. And now the question, okay, that's the dream. I, I suppose here that I know P, but can I am able to estimate also the proportion parameter? And this is much more tricky. So to solve this problem, we introduced my, with my co-author, uh, Laurent Borde, in Lemas in 2006, uh, a model with more structure here, because we say, okay, L is a mixture of one known component plus an unknown F, supposed to be zero symmetric, and located at mu. And the symmetry here is uh, this condition, is that F of X is equal to one minus F minus X, and uh, this, is, uh, this plays a crucial uh, role in our results because it will help to pick the right proportion P because we try to, to detect when we reach this condition. Okay. So, indeed, if we consider now the same idea as before, but with a location parameter mu unknown, uh, so uh, we introduce a, a new parameter, a current parameter mu, which helps to solve the estimation of p. Uh, so we create a, a new a candidate of for f on the p and mu, which is this. Okay, this comes from the previous slide. If we consider, okay, the same idea as before. So I, if I want to, to cancel the mu here, I have to add a mu to x. So this term will vanish. If I add a mu to x, here and here, and I put this term here, I will get exactly the, the, the next formula here. Okay, this is the same idea, but with a mu here. And uh, I notice that on the p mu equal to p0 mu0, the two parameters, I will retrieve my symmetry. So this will be equal to this. But the question is, does this happen only once over the parametric space? Okay, because my goal is to, to test this correspondences to this matching. So does it happen only once over the parameter space? If it, the answer is true, then I'm able to, to pick up the right parameter, P0, M0, okay? And uh, so this is very connected to the identity problem for this kind of models. So we found, uh, so the identity is, the semi-parametric identity is this, this problem. You consider two com two representations of the same model competing on the p mu and p prime mu prime. And if they're equal, are we able to, to say that 
necessarily the parameters p mu, f are equal to p prime, mu prime, and f prime. If we can conclude these kind of things under minimal conditions, then we have an additivity of our, our model. So um, that is denoted by mf, mg, the second order moment of f and g. If these moments are not uh, connected by this relation, if uh, this distribution have, have uh, moments of order three with a Fourier transform for positive for G, then you can discuss this condition in a general way and uh, decide that you have uh, indeed this, this result uh, holding, okay? And you have also uh, more uh, like tail-oriented uh, conditions uh, saying that uh, if you consider f of x minus, minus beta for all beta in R, and you, you normalize by G, if uh, it goes to zero when G goes to if x goes to infinity, okay, um, um, or minus infinity, then you can discuss this model easily and uh, have a positive conclusion for your, ad your identifiability, right? So, um, and this second, the second proposition here is very similar to what happens in the parametric case, actually. This kind of argument are usually used for, for the, to discuss the parametric case. In the Gaussian case, the proof is exactly the same, okay? So now, once uh, you, can, you can tell that uh, this condition only happens when P mu is located at P0 mu 0, you can build a contrast D of uh, theta, okay, uh, which uh, check every time if f under theta is equal to one minus f minus x under theta, and you con you compare these two versions of f under theta, you take the square and you integrate it uh, versus the distribution of your, your observations. And uh, of course, you can uh, make an empirical version of this contrast by just uh, estimating, you have to consider for the distribution of the observation, a kernel smooth CDF. So you integrate the estimator of the density basically. And if you do that, you, you can minimize this empirical contrast uh, over the parametric space. And then uh, this is a good candidate to pick up the right parameters. Okay. And under this, uh, this building, building this met the method this, this way, we can prove uh, a general result. So you have consistency of your, your methodology and uh, you have also uh, square root of n convergence um, of the equivalent parameters and also of the inverse plug-in um, CDF. So it converges to the right, CD right CDF and uh, your difference here is uh, this kind, okay? So you have a plugged-in inverse CDF, and this is the right CDF. Okay, so this, this was the result we get uh, with uh, Laurent Bord and uh, Sindelmas in 2006 and 2010. And uh, in, this, in this work, in the previous work, sorry, in this work, you, I've, you, I mentioned every time that the symmetry was, was very, very important to get our results. And in 2016, uh, Patrin Sen and GSSB um, thought about this problem in a different way. They said, okay, we have indeed a, an identifiability problem here because we have actually an infinity of possible uh, representation of the same mixture. Indeed, if you consider this model and you take a piece of G, you put it in the, in the, in the back of the expression here, you again have a, a structure in G plus a new distribution here, which is, a, sorry, which is a, a true CDF because you have, you have a convex combination of these two components. So you can create a new additional um, a component, F index P of mu, uh, P, of lambda, P of lambda, sorry, and the P of lambda is this term, P plus lambda. So if you squeeze this parameter uh, you have three cases, three cases. If lambda is positive, you still have a true CDF here. If lambda is, lambda is equal to zero, you retrieve f of x. But if lambda is negative, something wrong can happen. F, fp of x is, is possibly not a true CDF anymore because it's not increasing anymore. So 
because this term gets negative, so you, you take this component plus something which is negative here, so it can decrease. So you have, a, you have troubles in building a true CDF. Okay, so thinking this way, uh, Patra Essence say, okay, the right parameter in this kind of model is the infimum in pi in 0, 1, so that the inverse CDF is a true CDF. Okay, the, okay. so it's fair enough. It's a good way to think about this problem. So to, to estimate now the right P0, they say, okay, we're going to define an acceptable domain on pi, take the infimum uh, of the acceptable domain, and the acceptable domain is defined this way. Uh, you consider Cn of a square root of n, a term going to zero, basically, and you define all the pi such that the distance between the inverse CDF and its closest regularized version is not too far. So if it's not too far, P is acceptable, and you take the infimum of this, this pi. Okay, and um, they prove that uh, their method is consistent in probability, but you, they don't have uh, any central limit theorem, and the method is, uh, is basically uh, negatively bi biased. Okay, so it's a very big step in this literature, but we don't have any uh, asymptotic results. So it's a big concern if you want to do some testing based on this approach. You don't have any hope about, about that. You, you cannot, okay? So, uh, so usually people used to do a nice asymptotic result with, as, with a symmetry. If you don't have symmetry, you don't have any hope about asymptotic results for, for now. And um, now I would like to come back to the, the kernel of uh, the presentation, which was what we do if you want to test, uh, okay, sorry, sorry. So I, I, I go back to my, uh, to our results about testing problems. So if we go back to the testing problem, uh, we did some, uh, some works recently with uh, um, Denis Pomeré, Yaya Sadi, and Xavier Millot. So we addressed uh, in the contamination model the, the testing of, uh, of F belonging to a given parametric family. Okay, this was a, a work with Denis Pomeray. And uh, we recently considered also the, the two sample problem, uh, so in, in which you basically consider two samples from uh, these contamination distributions, and you want to test if F1 is equal to F2. But again, we did this, uh, this test based on the results I presented earlier, uh, based on the symmetry. So F1 and F2 are supposed to be symmetric. And, uh, you try to test if F1 is equal to F2 up to a location parameter, okay? But again, the symmetry is very strong in our, um, plays a very strong role in our results. So our dream now is, would be to, to be able to do the previous work, okay, this one, but without assuming the symmetry anymore. So basically doing things uh, like Patrice and did in their paper. So uh, we don't want any shape constraints if we can minimal assumptions, knowing that there is no semi-parametric asymptotically normal estimator uh, in that case, okay? So what we do? And uh, the, the motivation behind this, this challenge was to, to analyze um, the excess of COVID due to, uh, no, the, the excess of mortality due to COVID in, uh, in the early times of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, okay? So, we studied the, the mortality of, uh, let's say, two countries, I and J, and uh, wanted to test if the unknown uh, component due to the COVID, because, okay, we identify standard mortality J in these countries, plus an effect due to COVID. And the effect can be direct or non-direct, because uh, many sources of the COVID uh, uh, excess mortality can be, of course, directly impacted by the infectious disease, but also have, can be expressed through um, non-direct uh, channels like so social problems, economic, environmental, uh, or healthcare channels. So everything is, is plugged in this component, okay? And the goal was to, to try to test if the Fi, Fj are equal, knowing that uh, the symmetry is not, no longer interesting here because Clearly, older people were much more impacted compared to young people. So 
the symmetry is here is not um, acceptable anymore. And we want to test anyway that this can, if this condition uh, happens or not. So this is the, the very basic uh, problem which motivated us. Okay. So I will um, I will say things very similar to previously. So I will change a little bit our notations. Since we do not suppose that we have a symmetry um, with respect to a location parameter, we will uh, define, sorry, we define uh, the inverse CDF like this. So we don't need mu anymore because we not suppose that f is symmetric about anything. So f is this way. So in, in some way it's simpler. Okay, under the true parameter p star, uh, you retrieve exactly fi, the true uh, known CDF. And my, uh, my sample of interest are x1, x2, I will compare, in which I will compare the unknown component. So the contaminant, the contaminant component. The sample size are connected by this kind of relation. So there is a kind of proportionality. Even asymptotically, we keep this, uh, this regime. And uh, the idea is now to, to recycle the previous idea. So we're going to create uh, two parametric uh, inverse uh, CDF. The proportion P will belong to a parametric space, which is uh, defined by delta 1, delta 2. Delta 1 is greater than 0. Delta 2 is a little bit higher than 1, 1 in case we have to deal with a uh, uh, proportion is the border of the parametric space, so it, it can exceed a little bit uh, one. It's not a big deal, okay? And uh, so this is an inversion approach, so for standing for the eye of IBM. And then I will, we just uh, consider the best matching uh, situation. We're going to compare the inverse F1 on the P1, F2 on the P2, and try to find a, a couple P1, P2, uh, making uh, this discrepancy equal to zero. If we find this matching, then we can, we're going to say, okay, that's perfect. We can uh, say that uh, the F1 is equal to F2. This is a very basic idea, okay? So, uh, indeed, on the SGO, if you have equality, you will find exactly a, a couple theta composed by P1, P2 such that d of theta star is equal to zero. It's a minimizer of the discrepancy measure. When under H1, you hope that we never get zero. If you go across the parameter space, you try to minimize this discrepancy, you will find probably a, a theta c, a minimizer, but the distance taken at, the, at this point will never reach zero. It will be strictly positive under H1. Okay, and this is the, the, the moment in which we bypass the patron sen approach, because patron sen would say, OK, I will take the ephemerum of D, but be careful, you have to check every time that your inverse candidate is a true CDF. We don't suppose that anymore. Uh, we just minimize over theta, OK? Yeah. When patron sen would every time check that you have a true CDF or something acceptable. We bypass this, uh, this uh, step. We just go there, OK? And um, now the question, is it a big deal? The answer is no, because if you just look at your contrast and the zero, you will find minimizer in the zero one basically uh, domain, the this square. When on H1, you have two situations. Your minimizer can be inside the natural parametric space zero one square or outside. So you will bump into the boundaries of the domain. If, you, if your minimizer is very, very far from this domain, you will just reject the, the testing uh, problem. You will say it's not challenging. It's clearly not uh, fitting. So the more challenging situation is under H1 when your minimizer ins is inside the, the zero one square. OK? So um, now we have to discuss the identifiability in this kind of situation. So um, what happens under H0? If you uh, look at this condition, the perfect matching, F1 of P1 is equal to F2 to, to P of P2. If you, you develop this expression, uh, you get this uh, development. So under H0, what happens if F1 is, is equal to F2? These two components merge together into a single component here. And if you suppose that G1 is not in the span of G2F, uh, you just discuss a very simple uh, freedom for a family of functions, 
which implies that P1 is equal to P1 star and P2 is equal to P2 star. So the answer comes directly. Under H1, if F1 is different from F2, you have now a, com a family of four components to discuss here. And if this family is free, then you can it, it, go, it, come, it goes to the fact that P1 star is equal to 0 and P2 star is equal to 0. But this, this is impossible because you have a mixture. So uh, theta star belongs to the 0 1 square excluding 0. So you cannot get a perfect matching on the H1, which means that your contrast will every time go positive. Strictly. So once you, you get this, um, this analysis, uh, the question is how to build a test statistic to, to say, is it the matching uh, reasonable or you have to quantify deviation compared to zero? Is it a big deviation or not a, a big deviation? So during, if you, you go back to the previous slide, we've, um, we did with Laurent Bort some very similar analysis, sorry, of the like uh, functional central limit for the for the parameters. We, we can expect by some uh, empirical process uh, machinery that uh, we can get a central limit theorem for the, the true parameter going to the true, uh, for the estimator going to the true parameter theta star. And uh, if we plug the estimators into the inverse CDF, we can expect that we will have a central limit theorem also for this inverse object, okay, going to the true, to the true uh, CDF. On the H1, uh, we'll get something similar. So the, on the H1, the model is misspecified, but we can expect that the estimator will go to the minimizer of the contrast, and that also the inverse CDF will go to the theoretical object inversed on the P, PC. PC is the minimizer of the contrast, again. So uh, we do have a, a right uh, central limit theorem and a, a kind of uh, Misspecified the uh, central limit theorem here on the H1. And uh, okay, so qu the question since our empirical contract is, vi is this, uh, we, we consider n at the n evaluated at, at the minimizer at theta n. So this is the term. And this term, um, since we have a central limit theorem for this and this, we can expect that we have a central limit theorem for the difference. And uh, since the n is, is outside, we can put the n inside and retrieve clearly an expression. You will expect that it will converge to a, a Gaussian process, but we have to go uh, more deeply into the, into the analysis. So what is the stochastic behavior of this statistic? Okay, but you can, you can trust that we will get thing, things interesting here and here, so you can use this results inside the integral. So you probably converge towards the stochastic integral. So now I will simplify my notations. I will just consider D the difference between the inverse F1 and F2 and uh, D at N, the, the empirical quantum part of uh, D. So I just plug L1 by, by its empirical uh, version and L2 by its empirical version here, okay? So, on the S0, since D on the theta star, the true parameter is equal to zero, this term doesn't need to be recentered. It doesn't, the term, okay, this term is equal to zero, okay? And you, as I said, you can expect a central limit theorem for this deviation. And so this integral of the square of this term will go to a, a stochastic integral. You can possibly tabulate, okay? So I will call this convergence, the inner model convergence on the S0. Now, on the H1, what happens here? Your, your term here, without uh, anything here, you can center it with the correct uh, centering term, which is D of X of theta C, the minimizer of the contrast. If you subtract here, you have to add it, and uh, you develop the square. You have three terms, this one, this one, and this one. So this one will basically behave like, uh, will go to a stochastic uh, integral. And uh, you have two terms, one with a strong drift in N. This term is, uh, is strictly positive, plus a term which is a small, uh, is a small toe of N almost surely. So this is negligible to compare to this. So you have one inner convergence here with 
towards something very similar to what happened on the H0. So this is very similar to what happens to H0, but on the H1, you have this additional term, V1 in red, which goes to, to N, uh, to infinity with uh, N regime, okay? So you have a strong drift to infinity. Now you can expect uh, that your test statistic will be Tn, N of uh, at the N evaluated at theta N, at, okay? So, uh, so you saying that, uh, okay, under the inner model convergence, uh, your, um, your test statistic will converge to some stochastic integral on the theta star and theta c, the minimizer of the contrast. This happens on the both H0 or H1. So uh, if you are able to now sample these stochastic integrals, you can also evaluate their quantile, so the 95% the quantile in an empirical way. So you can, you can compute this by Monte Carlo method. So you can decide my uh, rejection rule, saying that, okay, if Tn exceeds this quantile, I will basically reject my, uh, my matching. So if the test statistic, basically, if you, to, you want to interpret uh, this, if the test statistic is too far from the inner uh, model convergence regime, you suspect that something is going wrong. So I will illustrate this, um, this departure in uh, five slides. Okay, so, so under some conditions of, about identifiability that you can also uh, take an expansion of the contrast um, around the, the minimizer of the contrast and so on, you can prove indeed a very similar result to what I, I presented before. So your, your parameter converges to the minimizer of the contrast P1C, P2C, which is P star on the H0 and P1C on the H1. So you have this result happening, and uh, you can, uh, so, okay, so the, the important thing is that uh, the, the coherence matrix, matrix here, which is very tricky, implying many, many terms, uh, is completely closed form. So, and the ingredients to compute this coherence uh, involve a, a calc uh, matrix, uh, some regularization terms, the, also the coherence, source of the empirical processes. So you put everything together and you can identify your asymptotic coherence matrix. All these coherence matrices can be estimated uh, almost surely uniformly at the um, one minus uh, one fourth uh, rate, basically. So everything is, is tractable, is, is you can estimate it. And you have a, a clean result now that saying that your test statistics goes to this integral on the H0, and it goes to this integral on the H1 plus uh, drift term V1n going to infinity with n, almost surely. So uh, now, now I will illustrate what I was saying. Um, this is the distribution of a stochastic integral on the H0. So we computed in solid, so in black, uh, the theoretical uh, distribution uh, given one sample. So what we did, we, we sampled uh, big um, capital N uh, stochastic processes in the integral. And uh, this, this you uh, sample from the asymptotic distribution in, in, in black. And we did also did a uh, pure Monte Carlo uh, estimation of the test statistics. So we did a capital N experiments, computed these uh, results and uh, comp compare the distribution of this to the theoretical distribution. And we see that it matches almost perfectly. This is on the H0, so our theoretical result works fine. And on the H1, uh, this is the asymptotic uh, component associated to the inner convergence um, regime. And this is the, the Monte Carlo uh, distribution of the of capital N experiments, so you see clearly that uh, it goes to infinity with a, a, a location um, going, you have a mode is here going to infinity with N, so you have a clear departure of the distribution of the um, test statistic on the H1. So we did some simulations uh, with uh, 
different type of support, so the real line here, uh, R plus support, N, etc. And the sample size of all the simulations were, was 2000. Okay, so for the, um, the level, uh, we have a heat map uh, saying that everything is globally fine because when it's yellow, it's basically uh, 5% or over 5%. But uh, in some cases, when the proportion in the model are too small, okay, 0, 1 or 0, 3, with some changing models, we have, uh, we have issues. So we exceed largely the, the level. But we have to mention that uh, when you go to 3,000 observations, uh, everything goes fine. They go closer to 5%. So it's a matter of, uh, of sample size here. And we did also uh, uh, power studies. So uh, Again, with uh, alternative um, uh, situations, and uh, the, results, the results are overall quite fine, except in uh, some challenging situations where the decision is quite to to answer. So um, I have some uh, some graph for the powers with a sample size uh, mentioned here and the logarithmic, logarithmic uh, scale, and uh, we have, uh, it depends if indeed on the, um, on the proportions here. When the proportions are very small, you see that uh, the power is quite, uh, quite weak. When uh, in the green, when the proportion increase, your, your power is uh, very sensitive to that. So it happens all the time, okay? Just to, just to tell. Now, uh, let's go back to uh, the motivation of, our, of this work. So we're interested in uh, understanding the impact of the COVID on the mortality of a, a panel of European countries. So we took some data involving, uh, sorry, involving France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Spain. Uh, we looked at the, um, the mortality of uh, ages uh, during these years, uh, trying to understand what was the normal distribution of, a year of uh, ages and looked at what happened in 2020, okay? So the death records uh, of uh, age groups are 0 to 14, 15 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 85, and 85 and plus. So we look at the mortality of these this categories of ages, and we try to understand if there is a distortion of uh, the standard um, profile uh, due to COVID, okay? So if we look at the data now to, uh, of the, the basic mortalities uh, uh, during the early times of um, the pandemic, we have uh, clearly a big, big, big bunch, uh, sorry, bump, excuse me, big bump of a mortality, except in, uh, in Germany here, but in Spain and so on, it was really, really dramatic, okay? And the distortion on the, on the Excuse me, uh, okay. So the modeling um, we do uh, here is that uh, we consider an event A saying, okay, one people dead during this period has been impacted by the COVID directly or non-directly. Okay, and X is a random variable indicating the age category for disease person, person picked at random during the 25th first week of 2020. The X, is labeled in uh, four classes, okay? And the distribution of X, okay, can be decomposed by the bias formula. If one person is impacted by the COVID, you get this unknown component. When it has not been impacted by the COVID, you retrieve the, let's say, the standard mortality, okay? And if we look at this mortality and the distortion due to COVID, we have here the standard years, and when with when I mention a cross here, is what happens in 2020, okay? So you see some distortion. It can be lower for young people because they used to go less outside during the pandemic and more diseased people due to uh, the lack of care, the disease and so on for elderly people, okay? Clearly we have a distortion. And we try to understand if the distortion is the same over the countries. So we applied our test and when you have green lights, means that you can, uh, you can indeed apply the test. If it's red, 
it means that you don't find any matching, which means that your parameters estimated goes outside the 0, 1 squared. So you have no matching in the, in the model sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense to compare the contrast because if you minimize the contrast, it goes uh, outside the, the natural parametric space, 0, 1 squared. And then the green situations means that you find indeed a minimizer inside the 0, 1 square. It happens for Belgium and Spain. It happens for Belgium and Germany. It happens for France, Germany, and for Italy and Netherlands. Okay? So you have a good matching. Uh, okay. You accept, sorry, H0 for here. Here also. Here. But here you, H1, H0 is uh, rejected. So you, you consider H1. So France and Germany, um, you find a minimizer of the contract inside 0, 1 square. But you finally you, you reject S0. Okay. Now, if you look at the inverse uh, CDF in this situation, uh, we have indeed a very good matching uh, of the contaminant components. Okay. This is the inverse CDF histogram. Okay. So this is. Uh, the, the results we get with this application. Now I would like to go to my conclusion. Um, so the IBM approach is interesting because it's a fully tractable solution and uh, there is uh, no shape constraints, which is a big achievement compared to Patron Sen. So we, we can work basically under the same conditions um, and apply uh, and do a test. And I would like to say also that we can generalize uh, our approach to to a B rate situations, imagine a B rate distribution with one known uh, CDF plus an unknown CDF F with two components, and you want to test if the components of the new, of the contaminant uh, distribution are um, independent or not. You can do that by using very similar approach. Okay, and you can also consider, uh, uh, like I would say, blending processes in which uh, the proportion change over time, and you want to test if you have uh, homogeneity in time of the contaminant components. So you are like in, more like into process, uh, stochastic process in this situation, but I think with uh, some mixing uh, results, you can also uh, do interesting uh, testing approaches. And uh, I would like to mention also the admix R package in which uh, every th all this machinery is uh, already um, Code it so you, you have nothing to do. If you are interested in this method, you can use this package and it, ha it has more than uh, 6,000 downloads since uh, 2021, uh, which is great. Okay, and um, now uh, I would like to introduce um, some uh, works we are doing with uh, uh, Xavier Mio, Denis Pomeray, and Yassali about the, the car mixture uh, clustering. So we we can, uh, using this, this kind of method, uh, text pairwise and groupwise uh, the, the profile of the contamination and try to find groups of countries uh, with the same uh, contamination profile, same, uh, same features. Okay, so I think uh, Xavier Mio will talk about this later. And uh, so for now, I would like to thank you so much for your attention.